We're going to get started with uh, Helen and managing Mox. Please give her a big round. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name's Helen, I'm a freelance programmer. I've been using Python for quite a few years. Um, this is my first year at Python, um, and, uh, I'm really excited to be speaking here and I'm really enjoying Bill Bow and having a great week. So um, I decided to write this talk, I wrote, originally wrote it for PyCon UK last year and um, I did that because, not because I felt like I was an expert on mocking but because um, it was something that I'd tried working with quite a lot and I'd struggled with and found, felt like I was sort of hacking my way around and not really taking the time to understand it properly. Um, then I started a new project and it had lots of API interactions and databases that I didn't own and things that were quite a good case for mocking. And, um, oops. And so I wanted to start doing things nicely and, and write lots of tests and, and try and understand this properly. So it's something that I've struggled with and learned a lot about and I wanted to share a few of the things I've learned. So what is a mock? A mock is a fake object that replaces a real object. And the main use for this is in unit testing. Mocks are a way to control and isolate the environment in which your test runs. So why would you want this? Well, first of all, you want your tests to be deterministic. If they are failing, it should be because there's something wrong with your code, not because of some external factor like a server being down. You need to be able to trust your tests. If you don't trust them, you'll start ignoring them. Mocking gives you more control over the inputs to your test. You can simulate different environments for your code and make sure it responds correctly to all kinds of scenarios. It's also fast. It's an in-memory operation, so it's generally quite a lot faster than the things it's replacing, like, like network calls and file systems. And the speed of your tests is really important. Um, if, again, if they're too slow, you'll stop running them. So I'm mostly going to be talking about the mock library that comes with Python. This is called unittest.mock. It's, um, don't, don't worry about the unit test name. You can use it with um, any, any framework. It works quite well with PyTest and other things. So it used to be a standalone library. It was written by Michael Ford, and it was brought into Python in 3.3. If you're using earlier versions, you can still use the standalone version, and that's actively maintained and kept up to date. So Python 3.3 plus, just do unit test.mock, otherwise pip install mock, and then import mock. So uh, we're going to start with a look at mock objects. You'll find yourself working with these quite a lot. So you import mock with a capital M, and that's the mock class. You set that up with uh, whatever values you want it to have. So here I'm setting a value, and then I can get that back as a property of the mock. If you try to use a property that you haven't set, that's another mock. And if you try to use one of its properties, that's also another mock. So you, it's mocks all the way down, and you can kind of dig down and set the values of, of these mocks and, and get them back. Mocks are also callable. And when you call a mock, it returns another mock. So we've got more mocks. If you want to change what your mock returns, then you can set its return value, and then when you call it, and you'll get, you'll get back the value that you set. So you can dig down as far as you want into this structure, and you can set, just go, go as deep as you want, and this is all, all about setting up the right, sort of the right environment for your code to pick up on. Another way that you can set up uh, what your mock does when it's called is side effects. So a side effect can be an exception. So if you assign an exception class to side effect on a mock, then when that mock is called, you'll get that exception raised. 
It can also be a function, so you can override the behavior of that. I don't find I use this a lot, but it is there if you need it. Um, and a side effect can also be a list of things you want to happen. Now, this is useful if you want, if your code is going to be making multiple calls to this mock and you want a different thing to happen each time. So I can set up side effect with a value, an exception, and then another value. So the first time I call it, I'll get the value. Second time, it will raise the exception. Third time, I get another value. Then if I try to call it again, I'll get a stop iteration because I ran out of side effects. And if you want it to go, for, go on forever, it's just an iterable, so you can, you can have cycle or something. So while you're doing things to mocks, they are recording everything that's happening to them. They record all the calls that are made and all the arguments that are passed in. And you can get that information, you can query that information using these assertion calls. And most of them want you to say which arguments you expected them to be called with. So we've got a cert called with, which looks at the last call that was made. It doesn't care what happened before that. You've got a cert called once with, which is the same, but it makes sure that it was only called once. You've got a cert any call, which just looks at whether that call was ever made with those arguments, doesn't care about the others. You've got a cert has calls, which um, you can give it a list of calls, and you can specify whether you care about the order. And then you've got a cert not called, which um, just you check that it wasn't called. Um, you need to be a little bit careful with that last one because um, so if you do this in Python 3.5, you create a mock, you call it, and then you assert that it wasn't called, you get an assertion error, and that's kind of what we might expect to happen. If you do the same thing in Python 3.4, you create the mock, you call it, you assert not called. And all that happens is that you get back another mock. And if, it doesn't, if that's in a test, it will just run and it won't fail. Now, the reason for that is that assert not called didn't exist before Python 3.5. So when we try to use it, it just behaves like another, any, anything that we might try to access on the mock. So... Um, <coughs> Yeah, that just passes, and that's maybe a little bit dangerous. If you do plan to use that call, make sure you know which versions of Python you, people are going to be developing with, and yeah, maybe just don't if you, if you can't. Um, so that's a little bit dangerous, and it has caught me out a couple of times, um, probably because I wasn't doing red-green TDD properly, which is bad, but um, Python... 3.5 uh, thankfully uh, does something about this. So we get these safety checks. Um, in, if you try to call something beginning with assert or a threat, because you know you might make typos, um, it will complain. So we've got assert call, which is being added in Python 3.6. If we try to use that in Python 3.5, we get an attributes error, and that's kind of good because it's telling us that something's wrong with our code. So, um, and if you really have things that are begin with a cert and you want to use them, then you can, there's a flag called unsafe you can use to switch that off. Now, when you're looking at, when you're using these assertion calls, um, you, you generally have to say which arguments you want to be passed in, you, you, you're expecting to be passed in, and they're generally fairly fussy about that, but um, sometimes you, you might not care about what, what one of the arguments was. Maybe your arguments are particularly complex, so you're testing them all in separate tests. Um, so you can use mock.any for that, and you can just pass that in, pass it in as in place of an argument, and that just says, I don't care what the value of this argument is. If you want even more control there, you can use comparison objects. So these aren't really a special mock thing, they're just 
a nice Python thing with magic methods, which uh, you might have been to other talks about this week. Um, if you have an object, um, an instance of a class that implements the EQ magic method, then you can implement a custom, custom mm -hmm. comparison and pass that in as a check on, in your assertion checks. So, for example, here I'm checking whether my function was called with a multiple of five, and it was, and then with a multiple of four, which it wasn't. And I've got a nice, um, nice nicely formatted string to describe what went wrong as well. You can have even more control over um, the inspection of your calls. Um, maybe you want to work at a lower level. You can say, was this mock called? How many times was it called? And get access, sort of raw access to all the, all the arguments that it's called with. So we've looked at a lot of features of mock objects. Let's have a look at how they, how they fit into your tests. Um, as a general kind of pattern, we'll be creating a mock and making sure it's in the right place. Then we'll be setting up the values on it, the environment for your test. Then we run the code under test. And then we check that our expectations have been met. So first of all, let's ha look at how we get a mock into place. Now for this, we use patch. So this tells Python where to put a mock. You, you give it a path to a module or a class or a function or anything that can be looked up as a path. And it will set things up so that when that path is looked up, um, it, will, it will give you back, rather than giving you back the real thing, it will give you back a mock. And you get access to that mock in your test. So you can manipulate that mock and, and kind of get that injected into your code via patch. Now the object it actually gives you is a magic mock, which is like a mock object, but it has some of the magic methods set up for convenience. But we don't need to worry too much about that. So there are a few different ways you can access patch, depending on what your situation is. First of all, we have a decorator. So I've just got a little example function, which I'm going to use going to be testing. It's, it um, uses requests to contact the GitHub API. It fetches a JSON document for a user and extracts that user's number of followers and returns it. So it just looks like that when, it, when we run it. So we patch our test method using requests.get. We get a mock object passed into our, our test method as a parameter we can then manipulate the values of the mock. So we chain all the way down through return values and objects and more return values and set up what we're going to pretend is being returned from this API. And then we can run our assertion and, and check that the right value came back. You can also move it up to the top of your test class if you've got one and have um, have, a, have it as a class decorator. If all your test methods are patching the same thing, then that's quite handy. You can stack multiple patches, but you need to be careful about the order in which you do that. It kind of works from the inside out, so the bottommost patch corresponds to the first parameter, and so on. Patch can also be a context manager, so we get a mock into our context, and that survives, the, the patch is active for the lifetime of the context. Um, so this gives you more control over the, over the lifetime of your mock if, if um, that's what you need. Um, it's, if, if you have any kind of clashes with other stuff that does clever things with parameters like PyTest or other such things, um, that, that it can be quite handy there. Um, I tend to use the decorator version when I can because um, I don't like long lines of code and these make your code longer. Um, okay, so 
you can you can have even more control with um, by calling start and stop on the object that returned by patch. Um, I don't find that's used too much, but it can be useful. One thing I particularly have struggled with in mocking was um, patch paths and um, how, how the lookups how lookups work and what path to use when I'm patching. Um, I often found that mocks weren't appearing where I was expecting them to, and I was getting very confused. So I just want to look at how how this works. So I've I've got my get followers function again, and it's in a module called GitHub GitHub Utils, and I've got a test for that. So the test imports GitHub Utils. GitHub Utils imports requests and pulls it into its own namespace. Coming back to our test, we patch requests.get, we get our mock, we manipulate it, and then we call get followers. Get followers looks up requests.get. Because we patch that path, it will get back the mock. So our test behaves as we might expect it to, and, and it passes. If you consider a slightly different example, where I've done a from request import get at the module level rather than looking it up inside the function. The test is almost exactly the same apart from the import. So if I import GitHub utils too, that imports get from requests, then our test patches requests.get. It gets the mark, manip manipulates it, calls get followers, Get followers called get. Get's already been looked up on requests, and it was looked up before we patched. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a slight delay, and then we get something that doesn't match the value we set up. And that's because it was talking to the network, because we patched. You might say we patched too soon. Um, a better answer to that is that we patched the wrong thing. And this is how we fix that. We patch what we patch the thing that our module has already looked up. So we patch it on the module itself because it owns a thing called get. So our test looks like this, and that works. The Python docs say ensure you patch the name used by the system under test. Another useful thing is patch.object. You can use this to attach a mock to part, another part of an object that you're already testing. For example, here I've got um, a simple greet function on my user class that says happy birthday to the user if it's their birthday. I'm testing that function, and I want to mock is birthday. So I get, I get a user object. I patch it by passing in the object itself, the, method I want, the name of the method I want to patch, and the return value I want I wanted to have. And when I, when I get inside that that context, then the user dot is birthday will return will is a magic mock that will return true. So that will make my test work. Mocking the time can be quite tricky. Date is, the date module is written in C, so you can't mock individual bits of it. If you try, you'll probably get something like this. You can mock the whole thing, but it does mean you've got to kind of chain all the way down to the bit you want, and you don't get a choice at whether you're mocking the other bits. So using the, it's my birth, uh, another kind of birthday-based method. So I patch that. I, I modify the return value of today, and, and that works. Um, possibly nicer way of doing that is the freeze gun library, which is pretty cool. You pip install freeze gun. And it comes with a decorator called freeze time, and you can that takes all sorts of interesting human friendly formats that you can put in. You can have dates and date times and so on. And that's it's it's pretty straightforward to use. And I quite like that library. Mocking the file system is also quite tricky. Um, there's a utility method called mock open, which helps you out here. You give it 
Um, you give it a parameter called read data, which you can tell it what data you want to pretend your file has, and it will set up a special mock that has um, the right, all the right sort of file file handled stuff. And when we, because we're using open, which is a built-in, we need to do something slightly different when we patch that, and we use, we need to use create equals true because we can't overwrite the built-in. We need to kind of create a local copy of open that our code is going to pick up on. But then once yeah, once we've got that, we can open and read our file. Um, there's one little problem with this. Uh, you can't iterate over that file handle. Your, your file handling code probably has a nice Pythonic interface like this. If you want that, then you've got to modify the mock that you get back from mock open and uh, chain all the way down to the iter magic method and set up the lines that you want. Um, note that if you're doing that in the context manager, you need to go through the enter magic method as well. If you want to mock a property, um, so we've got our person class again. I've made his birthday a property now. If you try to patch the object, that doesn't work. Um, you get this error. Not, le not entirely sure why. I mean, it's something to, I guess it's something to do with the way that properties work. But um, yeah, you need special handling for that. And for that, there's a parameter called new callable, which lets you say what type of mock you want to create. And that's a special mock class called property mock, set up just for this purpose. And the other thing there is that you need to patch the class rather than the object, which might be a little bit limiting, but as far as I know, that's the only way to do that. So I've just got a little example of some of some uh, a mock-based test. Um, it's based. I've got um, this very crude retry function. You pass it a you pass it another function, and it tries it tries over and over to call it until it succeeds. If you get a database error, it will wait a little bit and then try again, and it will keep doubling that delay. So when we're thinking about testing this, um, I can see two big reasons for mocking. First of all, we've got this um, we've got this time dot sleep, which if it's in our test, then it's going to slow our test suite down. And secondly, we want to be able to simulate database errors. Without you don't we don't want to cause real database errors. So this is. This is a test that I've written for this this um, this function. So we patch time dot sleep, and that's get, that gets rid of the delays for us. We get a mock object passed in as our parameter. Then we create another mock inside the function, and we set up. And this is this is going to be the the function that that's going to be run each time. And we set it up with three side effects: two failures followed by a success. We call our retry function, and then we have a look at what happened. So first we checked that it was called three times because we had two failures and then a success. Um, then mock sleep um, assert has calls. We're just checking that um, we're, we're checking the calls that, to, that the the delays that were made and making sure that that it was doubled each time. And then we check that the result that came back was what we set up as as a return value for that function. So that's just um, a little example for you. Um, I'm nearly out of time, so I had some little bit of stuff about um, when you mock and why you should mock. But um, I'm going to post these slides online afterwards, and um, also got some recommended reading for you. Um, the Testing Goat book by Harry Percival is very good and uh, talks quite a lot about. Uh, why you should mock and, and the advantages of mock and how it can help drive better design. Um, Gary Bernhard, Fast Test, Slow Test is a very good talk about the same sort of things. It's worth watching. And the unit test not mock library. I couldn't possibly cover every feature of, of mock in this time that I've tried. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great read. So, um,
So I'm Helen ST on Twitter and GitHub, and uh, there's also a GitHub repository of um, this IPython notebooks with this material. I know it's quite, the slides are quite dense, so there's some sort of interactive examples in there. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Please thank the speaker with, yeah, keep